Hello and welcome to another episode of Enigma Does Tech. Today, I'll be starting a new sort of sub-series called Field Tested. In this, series, in this little series, I'll be taking a piece of tech that I wouldn't normally use, or that is usually like lower caliper than what I already have, and using it for a weekend or longer. So, without further ado, let's get started. Hello and welcome to the first episode of Field Tested. Today, we're going to be looking at the GTX 745. This was a graphics card that was released by OEMs only. Uh, it appeared in many pre-builds from places like Dell and HP. There's no current MSRP I can find as it came in pre-builds, and I can't find any pre-builds that came with it, so I can't give you any representation of original pricing. Uh, it can be found on the used market for around 60 to 80 pounds though I got mine for just 20 pounds which is a great deal as they are quite expensive on used markets I would highly recommend against going out and buying one of these off eBay at least as they are very similar in price to the GT 1030 which vastly outperforms this card only pick up this card if you can find it for an amazing price My card came equipped with 4 gigabytes of GDDR3 VRAM, which I'll just be referring to as GDDR3 for the rest of the episode. This is the main limitation of the card, the GDDR3 VRAM. It doesn't even tend to be able to use all the RAM. It gets stuck around 2.5 gigab gigabyte marks before it hits 100% usage and is basically worthless. There are some models with um, 2 gigabytes of VRAM. Unfortunately, it's also DDR3. Because of how bottlenecked the GPU is, those models would still be a decent shout if you're in the market for one of these, uh, because you're not going to use it all. It also came with 384 CUDA cores at a base clock of 1033 megahertz. So on paper, it sounds like it would be a bit of a pushover. Give it a chance, and it will blow your socks off with what it can do. So before we start off with the benchmarks, I have to apologize for the lack of video to go along with these results. Uh, the card can do many things, but it seemed to struggle when it came to recording. Though, I didn't try in video shadow play, so that might work if you want to try it. So anyway, first up in the benchmarks we have CSGO. MSI Afterburner isn't currently working with CSGO, so I could only get the results from the benchmark map. In that, it performed pretty well, achieving an average of it of 80 FPS on all those settings except from shadows at 1080p. It was very playable during gameplay, uh, during regular gameplay, getting around 140 FPS when there was no like smokes. Uh, but please note that isn't a round correct. Uh, that isn't very accurate because that's just my personal what I thought. Overall, CSGO is very playable as long as you weren't set on 240 FPS. Next up we have Dirt Rally 2.0. Dirt Rally really surprised me in this case with how badly it performed. I don't know if it was because of the VRAM bottleneck or something else, but I assume this may be one of the cases where the slow VRAM will slow you down. Anyway, first I set the game to ultra low settings at 1080p and achieved an average of 32 FPS with 1% lows of 23 FPS and 0.1% lows of 22 FPS. The game did not look great. So I decided to drop the resolution down to 900p, which let me bump up to medium settings while still keeping it playable. With the lower resolution, it achieved an average of around 225 FPS. It felt pretty playable regardless. I think you could drop it down to 720p, you could possibly bump the settings up to high and get similar FPS, or keep them at medium and get way more FPS. Minecraft was running at 1080p with fancy settings and it achieved an average of 118 FPS with 0.1% lows of 24 FPS and 0.1% lows of 3 FPS. These were from loading in the world. In version 1.16.2, it was very playful, playable, but I prefer playing on 1.8.9 with a texture pack. On that, it performs much better. But overall, 
Minecraft wasn't very surprising with its performance. Next up, we have Rocket League. Now, here I set it to a performance settings at 1080p, and it achieved an average FPS of 71 FPS, uh, with 0.1% lows of 30 FPS and 0.1% lows of 25 FPS. Very playable. I don't think you could go any lower. You might want, you could bump it up if you wanted the higher settings, but I think performance is the way to go with Rocket League. Next up, I tried something I didn't think would work, but it turned out to. I tried No Man's Sky at the lower settings with 70% resolution scaler at 1080p, and it achieved 42 FPS on average, 1% lows of 31 FPS, and 0.1% lows of 1 FPS, which was not a common case, so I wouldn't worry about that. This was a very surprising result for me. I thought it would just crash out first thing, but no, you can play No Man's Sky on this. So, just like all of my reviews, I tested the GTX 745 for the benchmarks, but unlike all of my other reviews, where I switched back to whatever I was using before after I finished testing, in this case, I left it in the PC for the entire weekend to truly see what it can do. And I was pleasantly surprised. The 745 managed to meet all of my needs playing every single game I threw of it threw at it outside the normal benchmarks. It really is a good budget card if it can be found for the right price. It's really meant for nine ten hundred P gaming nowadays, which is fine, but I would definitely try get ten eighty P on lower settings because I like that ten eighty P. It's a shame about the DDR three slowing it down. It would really be great if it had a GDDR5 or even GDDR6 version. Regardless of that, I'm going to give the GTX 745 a B grade in a graphics card. It would be a great starting point for anyone who is building a small form factor PC in like an old Dell machine. As it is one of the more powerful, low profile, single slot GPUs NVIDIA have released. And so, thank you very much for watching. I hope you all enjoyed, and that you'll stick around to the next video. I'll be reviewing the Logitech G305 for the next Enigma Does Tech, so subscribe so you don't miss it.